So yeah, uh, good morning everyone. I uh, hope you guys can hear me. Uh, I'm Parsuraman, a professor in the Department of uh, Metallurgical and Materials Engineering here in IIT Madras. So welcome all to this uh, Gyan course on metal oxide semiconductors. We'll look at a bit of theory uh, and also some applications uh, of these metal oxides. Uh, so Professor Senso, uh, who will be actually uh, conducting the Gyan course uh, and then I would also have a few tutorials and lectures as part of the course. So uh, before we start, uh, maybe if you have your cell phones, you could just put them on vibrate uh, on mute. This course will be recorded, so it's easier, you know, we don't have uh, a cell phone noise in the middle of the recording. Uh, so just to tell you briefly about uh, Professor Celso, uh, he's an electrical engineer. Uh, from the University of Mar del Plata, Argentina. Uh, he did his PhD from uh, the University of Minnesota. Uh, his advisor was uh, Professor John H. Weaver and that's one thing in common that we share. So Professor John was also my advisor uh, maybe 10 years down the line uh, when he was in University of Illinois. So we both have the same uh, PhD advisor. So after completing his PhD, uh, Professor Celso has been working as a professor in the Department of Physics, uh, School of Engineering, uh, University of Mar del Plata in Argentina. He has a very varied uh, professional experience uh, and he's served as a visiting scientist in multiple universities. So that's how I actually met him. So when I was a graduate student uh, doing my PhD, he was a visiting scientist uh, at the university. So we met a couple of times over there. Uh, he's a prolific researcher. Uh, he's published a lot of papers, book chapters. More interestingly, he's also published books on popular scientific articles. Uh, he's a great teacher. So whenever I have doubts, I normally go to him and my advisor, John. Uh, so hopefully we can all use his experience and knowledge uh, as part of the course today. One thing, of course, is we're not restricting you guys to just uh, the classroom. Uh, Professor Celso will be here for the whole week. So if anyone wants to talk to him personally about your research, uh, you can always send me an email. I think I already got a couple. And then we will schedule some time for you uh, for a one-on-one -on -one session with uh, Professor Celso. So he will be sitting in the new academic complex that's called NAC. It's uh, the brand new building that's opposite the road from CRC. I'll, I'll confirm the, uh, the room number maybe today or uh, even tomorrow. You are also uh, you know, welcome to talk to me as well. I will also be available in the afternoons. Uh, if you want to schedule some time to visit our lab, uh, that can also be arranged. So it's not just you are here for a course that goes from 9 to 12 in the morning, but you could also make use of this opportunity uh, you know, to interact more with both Celso and me and also see the lab. So before I welcome Professor Celso, so one other thing that we both share is that he really loves coffee. So uh, I remember as a graduate student, he would always make coffee in the coffee pot at least twice a day. So the first thing I did get him here was because Chennai is of course known for his coffee. So I said he must be here. Right. So with this introduction, uh, I let Professor uh, Celso take over uh, and start the session. Thank you. Hope my English is good for you. My accent is the accent of a Spanish speaker with an Argentine accent. I hope it is fine for you. Okay, thanks a lot for the introduction, Rama. It is the first time in my life I'm in this, in this country. It's a real pleasure. I'm glad that so many people are interested in what I can tell you yeah, today. Uh, as Raman said, uh, I'm uh, nowadays working in the Institute of Technology, which is in, in my city, in the city I was born, yeah, called Mar del Plata. Mar del Plata comes the name from, from Silver Sea. Plata is silver in Spanish. Everything in Argentina is related to silver. Argentina, you know the name? You have the letters AG, Argentum, which is silver in Latin. Well, I, I would like to thank Professor Raman, my institute, and a bunch of guys who worked with me during the last years. Uh, 
This is a view of my city. My city is on the shore, part of 38, so it's much cooler, colder than here. Really, it's very warm to me, this place. My city is on the shore. You see there the map of Argentina. It's about 400, 400, 400 kilometers south from Buenos Aires, which is the capital. The population is about a tenth of the population you have here. Yeah? This is another view of my city. So let's go to the to the pond or what I came here to do. Uh, what I'm doing today is an overview of semiconductors in general, and in particular on oxide, semicond metal oxide semiconductors. Uh, but what I want to give you is some general ideas. I think that the general idea, this is a short course, so we don't have much time, but I want you to, to receive the ideas, concepts. Yeah? That's what I'm interested in especially. Then, then those basic concepts you can apply to many things. Yeah? I don't want to go in detail in something because I don't know how many of you are going to work in, in gas sensors. We are shooting to gas sensors. Yeah, that's what I'm working nowadays. But I want you to have the basic ideas. You can apply those ideas to many other semiconductor devices yeah, on related topics. Uh, what is interesting in what I'm going to talk, or what, what is the, the course is going to, to deal with, is that the basic mechanism is responsible for conduction in a polycrystal. We're going to work with polycrystals, polycrystal film. You know what a crystal is. In a crystal, you have order from the beginning to the end. Here we have regions with order, which are connected by without order. Yeah, that is called a polycrystal. So how poly electrical conductivity takes place in polycrystals is still a subject of debate. And many things here I'm going to tell you are under debate. And I, and I want you to transmit that to you. You know what is in the books? because it has no sense for me to travel 10,000 kilometers yeah, to tell you what is in the books. I want to tell you new things, or things which are nowadays uh, under discussion. People accept that conductivity in polycrystals is controlled by some barriers which form between the grains of the, of the polycrystal. Yeah? But except how those barriers are formed, on how they respond to different gases, uh, it's not clear. Yeah? And after so many years, it continues not to be clear. So what we are interested here in understanding from a basic point of view, yeah, what are the uh, conduction mechanisms? Yeah? Because based on that, that polycrystal can sense different gases. Yeah? We will see how that happens. Uh, and based on experiments, I'm going to present, we're going to propose models, basic models, yeah, that describe what is going on and what is taking place in that polycrystal to sense the gases. Uh, in fact, the problem is really very complex. Yeah, it's very complex. But we, we, have, we hope that there is a small number of basic laws. Yeah? And, we, and we, were, we were going to be able to describe what was going on based on those basic laws. And as I have a couple of quotes here, one of Einstein, who said that we are going to try to do things as simple as possible, but not, not, not more than that. Yeah? And another quote from Pauli, a Nobel Prize, who said that everything was made by God, but surfaces were invented by the devil. Yeah, and I want to, to describe what, what he's supposed to say, or wanted to say. Uh, he wanted to say that in, in, in a bulk, in a solid, we have some translation symmetry, what is called in a crystal. That is, you move and you always see the, see the same. That is a, that's essentially a crystal. But when you reach the surface, that periodicity, that what is called translation symmetry, does not work any longer. And weird things happen yeah, at the surfaces. And, and they're not easy to understand. That's why Pauli was making reference to the devil. 
but we are going to start from the from the end to see what we are looking for and what we are interested in. We are focuses we are focusing on sensors based on these semiconductor oxides. Uh, what happens when the gas makes constant uh, contact with a with a semiconductor or polycrystal film? What happens is that the gas molecules attach yeah, or uh, absorb on the surface and there is a change of electrons between the, the absorbed gas and the substrate and the, and the semiconductor film. And because of this interchange of electrons, the conductivity of the film changes. Are we doing fine so far? I'm going very fast, maybe? No, is it fine? You understand? Perfect. So, uh, if the conductivity changes, this is a way we have to check that we have some kind of gas in the environment. And that is the way we sense gases in the, in the environment. Uh, the key in all this process is oxygen, which is always present in our, in our atmosphere. Yeah? So if it, the oxygen changes, the, the amount of oxygen changes in the atmosphere, the conductivity of the gas changes. changes. But we, we don't care essentially for oxygen. Yeah? Essentially, that, that is what we need to breathe. But essentially, we are pointing to other type of gases. In particular, I was interested in carbon monoxide. Why carbon monoxide? Because carbon monoxide is terribly poisoning. Yeah? Within a small amount, we, yeah, we can die. Maybe here, heating is not a problem, yeah? But in my city, it's a problem and in many places in the world. And if the heating, heating is done by burning some, something that is a gas or a solid, and in that process, if the, if the combustion is not complete, carbon monoxide is produced. And this carbon, you don't need much carbon monoxide to make damage to us. The problem with carbon monoxide, it is, we, you cannot smell it. Yeah, you don't know it is present. You just go to sleep, and that's the beginning of the end. Yeah? So how this works? Well, essentially, is that equation that we see there. Yeah? Uh, we have oxygen absorbed on the surface of the polycrystal. The conductivity is very low. Carbon monoxide comes and steals, yeah, takes oxygen from the surface. Uh, the gas produces carbon dioxide, and electrons are released back to the, to the, to the film. So the conductivity increases. So in that way, we can uh, detect that carbon monoxide is present. Everybody agrees with this kind of uh, mechanism. And I wrote down the mechanism. It looks easy to understand. However, there are many details people do not agree. What is specifically what is going on in this process, which I have just described and sounds very simple. Okay. Here on the right we have a, a picture yeah, of the surface of the polycrystal. Typically, the polycrystal most, most use is tin dioxide. It's the most sensitive uh, semiconductor oxide. And there on, on, on the back on the right, we have, let's, let's use this. Yeah, here on the right, we have a, a, it's just a scheme of atoms forming a, a crystal. And then we have oxygen there and carbon monoxide arrives and takes one oxygen from the surface, reducing the amount of oxygen on the surface. Right? <coughs> well, let us start from the very beginning. Towards the end of the 19th century, uh, people thought that we knew everything. It just was a matter of applying what we know, what we knew at that time. We had the mechanics of Newton, the thermodynamics of Gibbs, the statistical mechanics of Boltzmann, the electromagnetism of Maxwell. Yeah, all that was, was available at that time. So there was nothing new to learn. That it was we, we need only to apply what we knew. Yeah? But there were some little problems. Little between, you understand that. Little problems. 
that were not solved at that time. One problem was the, the matter radiation balance. People did not understand how materials could uh, radiate electromagnetic waves. The photoelectron effect was another problem. People did not understand how electrons could interact with a metal to extract electrons from, from uh, in general, from a sample. People did not understand how an atom was built. Within, at that time, it was at the beginning, say 120 years ago, people did not understand how the basic piece of the, that builds matter worked. Yeah? We, didn't, we didn't know what was the structure of an atom. And regarding to a specific topic we are talking here, we didn't know why some materials conduct electricity and others did, did not. So um, the conductivity is a very wide yeah, characteristic of uh, in, in nature. For example, I put here a couple of examples. A low temperature, the resistivity of a good insulator is 10 to minus 10 ohm centimeter. Uh, and, uh, and for a good conductor, yeah, it goes to 10 to the 22. So there is 32 orders of magnitude between a good conductor and a bad conductor. And we didn't know why. When I say we, I mean humanity. Yeah, it was not a minor mistake or a minor detail to, yeah, to understand. So that was the situation at the, at the beginning of last century. But fortunately, we have our legion of superheroes to solve these problems. And it's a famous picture of the Solvay Conference, 1927. And there are many famous people there who eventually could solve these problems. Uh, you can see Einstein there in the first line in the middle. Madame Curie there, the only woman. Um, a bunch of very famous guys. You can discover them. Like Schrodinger, Langmuir, Max Planck. Yeah. And fortunately, we could solve. They solved the, these problems to us. Well, probably the if you can say establish an origin for quantum mechanics, we can refer to Louis de Broglie. You pronounce the Broglie or the Broglie? In the States, they say the Broglie. To me, the Broglie is was French. And it was in 1924. Louis de Broglie, he was a prince. Prince Louis, Louis de Broglie proposed that relationship, the relationship we see here. Yeah? Uh, he said that uh, matter with the uh, momentum P, it had connected a, a wavelength. That is, a wave was, was connected to, to matter. Interestingly, Louis. This was written by Louis de Broglie as in his PhD thesis. This, I think it's the only case in the history of, of science that the, if with a thesis a guy gets the Nobel Prize. I don't know of any other. Well, he said that matter could have uh, wave properties. Yeah? And that was in 1924. Three years later, well, that was verified by, in two labs. Uh, Davison and German in the United States and a, Tom, a guy named Thompson in the United Kingdom, George Thompson. And this George Thompson got the Nobel Prize to, to show that it was the case. Yeah? He could diffract electrons. And diffraction is a typical property of waves, not of matter. This was a proof that matter had wave properties. There's something historically very interesting. Another Thompson got the Nobel Prize to, to show that the cathodic rays were, in fact, electrons and they were particles. A guy also named Thompson. He was the father of this Thompson. So everything remained in, in family. One to, to establish that electrons were particles, another to establish that electrons were waves. Well, and since then, since then, when we talk of matter, we have to deal with waves. Yeah, there is no other way out to this. So if there are waves, we 
need an equation for waves, a wave, a wave equation yeah, that dictates how that wave function behaves. And there were many people trying to solve this or finding that equation for matter waves, and eventually Schrödinger presented his famous wave equation. Uh, uh, have you been all exposed to this, to wave equ this equation? I guess so. No, yes. Okay, here is written in, as a function of time and space in one dimension. Yes. Uh, this has been very successful yeah, in, in representing and showing how nature works. But there is a problem with this equation in general, is that the psi, which is the wave function, people do not agree what it exactly represents. This goes to those who are interested in philosophical aspects of quantum mechanics. There yeah, are people nowadays discussing or arguing what exactly that psi represents. And it's a very famous quote by Walter Huckel, which is very funny to me. That's why I, I wrote it here. He said that Irving, Irving, referring to Schrodinger, with his psi can do calculations quite a few, but what thing has not been seen, or just, just what does psi really mean? Yeah, that's very funny. I think so. So. For those interested in this topic, it's, it's very interesting. There is another other subject related to this, is the famous Schrodinger's cat. I don't know if you're, you know of this. There is a famous problem with this cat. Uh, this is Erwin Schrodinger, and this is his cat. In fact, I'm cheating, this is my cat. But I couldn't find a picture of the real Schrodinger's cat. And he is wanted dead and alive at the same time. Not that they were alive, but dead and alive. Well, let's go to our topic. Uh, let me get out of this. The interpretation, the most famous interpretation of the, that function psi is the interpretation of the Copenhagen School, or the School of Copenhagen. Uh, Max Born was there, Niels Bohr was there, and they understood that the well, that wave function is related to a probability, the probability of finding a particle in that place. Yeah, and this 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 is the interpretation of the School of Copenhagen. Yeah, for those who are interested, I'm just going just to mention so you know, from a philosophical point of view, this is a positivistic interpretation. Uh, those who are realistic, I don't know if you are having exposed to these ideas, those who are realistic do not agree with that interpretation, with the most popular interpretations in many books. And among them, Einstein never agreed with this interpretation. Yeah. Well, uh, if we have an, a wave equation, we have to end up with a, with a wave. And the most a common or regularly used type of wave is a plane wave. So if I've solved the wave equation, I have to end up with a plane wave. And you have been written, I think, in basic courses, a wave wave of this of this type. Yeah? A function of kx mi minus omega t, the time. So a wave equation is a, a fun function of yeah, space and time, and it's defined for every s position in the space and every time. Yeah, I pointed that specifically because you have to realize that this is a, a complete abstraction. Nothing exists for any position in the space and any time. It's impossible to build. We are already late. That plane wave was not yesterday here if I want to build one one wave. So this plane wave has a specific values for the for the constants k, the wave vector, and for the frequency. Yeah? Uh, and if that is the case, we can build our plane wave for for matter. Well in fact if you go to the 
change this equation and you plug in this this form, it doesn't work. You realize why? You have a second derivative in, in x and the first derivative in time. The second derivative of the cosine is a cosine with a minus, yeah, regardless of the of the sign. And the first derivative is a sine, so you cannot make a cosine equal to a sine. So it doesn't work. So what it works is the exponential form of a, of a plane wave, which is this one, yeah? You have here. This is compatible with the wave equation, yeah, the Schrodinger equation. And if that is the case, the, the speed of that wave is the ratio between the frequency and the wave vector, omega and k. And that is called the phase velocity. Yeah, that we have a sine or a cosine which is extended in all the space and time and is moving, yeah, with the speed omega over k. For a free particle, it's not very difficult to to find that e the energy. If you remember the all, all energy we have is the kinetic energy, we can connect the energy with the momentum. P is m times v, so to the square divided by two m gets you you get one half of mass times velocity to the square. Yeah? And since E energy in quantum mechanics is related to the frequency as h bar times omega and the momentum is h bar k. We introduce this, this relationship and we get the relation between omega and, and k. Right? I think you have done this in basic courses in quantum mechanics. Have you never been exposed to these things? I guess so. No? Yes. Good. So here we have a, 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 a first problem. This is a, a wave function extended in all the space and time. And look at the, the relation between omega and k. It's not linear. This is not, it's a dispersive relationship. The relation between omega and, and k is called a dispersive relationship. And they are not proportional. If they're not proportional, that means that the speed of uh, the of waves depends on their frequency. Have you seen exposed to this too? I guess so. So, uh, and since this is expanded in all space and time, uh, we cannot describe with this a particle. A particle is in a, in a place and in a time. So we need to build something which does not exist here, exists here, and then does not exist again. So we have to make a wave packet. How do we build a wave packet? Well, we can do it by summing plane waves. Yeah? This is what classically we will have, a particle moving with a specific velocity and with mass m. And we want to build something which is called a wave packet, that is a function that does not exist, exists, and then does not exist again. Right? Well, to build that, we have to sum up plane waves. Yeah? And, and the wave packet, we can show that it moves at, at that speed, which is cool, it's called group velocity, which is related with how omega changes with k. I guess you have done that in, in courses. And also, something interesting happens. If you want to build a small wave packet, very narrow, yeah. As, as, as much as you want to specify where the wave packet is, where the particle is, the more plane waves you need. Yeah? And it's not difficult to show that the product of the dispersion in, in x and in k in the wave vector yeah, is always larger than one half. And it's very easy to change Delta K is simply delta P over H, yeah? That's coming from the De Broglie's relationship. And so we've easily arrived to this relationship, which comes out naturally for waves. And this is the uncertainty principle, yeah? But there's nothing magic, nothing weird about that. It comes out naturally from, from waves. Okay. 
So if we want to build a wave packet and we want to make a pulse, we are going to need an infinite number of wave packets. Uh, so summing all of them <coughs> with different weights, A of K, yeah, we are going to be able to build the function we want, the wave packet with the shape we want. So A, a of K is it's called the Fourier transform, yeah? It's, it's the, the weight of the different plane waves. But it's the weight we have to give to any plane wave to build that, that specific wave packet. And if the wave packet moves, we have to add the dependence with time. So this is the relationship, yeah? So we have plane waves, that exponential is the wave. Is, is the, defines the wave plane with different, different weights. We sum up everything, we come out with a, a wave packet, which is moving, yeah? It's moving in times. And I have another funny quote here, William Bragg. Yeah, because people is arguing and still is arguing about these things. Yeah, it says that electrons behave like waves on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, like particles on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, and like nothing at all on Sundays. Yeah, so we have to to live with this. Nature have a double property of being matter, having properties of matter and properties of waves. Uh, that's life. What can we do? That's nature. Anyway, we used to deal with, we, we work with plane waves because they are very easy to deal with and, and we can arrive at many conclusions which are right. Yeah? We don't need to, wait, to work with wave packets all the time. But we want to know what happens with one particle, the particle is moving and how that particle is going to evolve in time. We have no other way than to deal with yeah, a wave packet. Well. Uh, we saw the Schrodinger equation depending on position and time. Yeah? Uh, we can separate the, 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 the connection of the wave function in, in that differential equation. We can separate the, the terms depending on, on space and time. And we can deduce an, an equation which is independent of time. I guess you have done that. It's called separation of variables. You propose that the wave function depends is a product of two functions, one dependent on position and one dependent on time. You plug it into the Schrodinger's uh, equation. Uh, when you arrive to two equations, one depending only on, on position, which is the one I, I wrote here. Yeah, and I, I think this is uh, the equation you have been dealing most of the time. I guess so. So this is the Schrodinger, Schrodinger's equation independent yeah, of time. And with that equation, you have solved many type of problems, I guess, along your career. One of the simplest problems is a particle between two walls. Yeah. This, is, this will be the picture, the classical picture. We have a particle of mass m velocity v between two walls. This is a one-dimensional problem. And this would be the picture in thinking in energies involved. You have two walls which are impenetrable, yeah, and the particle can move between two walls. Classically, the solution for this is very simple. The particle is just bouncing in both walls, going back and forth, and that's it. But when we solve the yeah, Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's equation, the solution is very different. Yeah? and new problems arise. By solving that equation, you arrive to a very interesting solutions. That is, the first one is that, the most important is that the, the energy cannot be whatever you want. The values of energy are, are, are very specific and are here on the, on the left. And the wave function takes that, these shapes, yeah, which we see here on the right. And if the the wavelength, you see the wavelength, yeah, this is this is half of the of lambda. This is actually lambda for this case. 
yeah in this case is shorter it's two thirds of the of l uh, and so on and the wavelength is cannot be whatever you want the vector k cannot be whatever you want and if k is is discrete in the sense that there are specific values of case of k that are possible and not other values the the energy of the particle between the, 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 the two worlds cannot be whatever you want. It's, quant yeah, it's quantified or quantized. Yeah? You have a specific values of the energy, which are here on the, on this, in this picture. Uh, the differential equation you arrived, plugging in the conditions for this problem, is similar to the, the equation for for a string between two fixed points. And these are the possible harmonics for the string. Yeah, the differential equation is exactly the same, so the solutions are the same. The meaning is different, but the differential equation is the same. So these are the possible yeah, vibrations of a string, and they are also describing the wave function of a particle in a well with infinite walls. Yeah? Infinite walls. I think you have solved this, and if you, if you had a, a quantum mechanics course, a basic quantum mechanics course, and of course this is a very simple model, a one-dimensional model with uh, infinite walls, something very simple, but the solutions are really, they are shocking. You cannot have any energy, the energy is quantized. Yeah? And even though this is a very simple problem, it's telling us if a particle is confined, you say confined, it can move just in a specific region of space, in a finite region of space, the energy is quantized. And that's what happens in atoms. Yeah? Electrons in atoms are just confined to move in a reduced, you know, specific uh, yeah, size, a specific place. So the solution of this simple problem is telling us that the energy is quantized in atoms. And you can solve that. It's much, much more complex. I don't know if you have done it. You have to solve it. The differential equation is quite complex because the Schrodinger's equation now has a potential energy that depends on, on R, on the distance. Yeah, to the proton. If you are solving hydrogen atom, which has one proton, one electron. Uh, but if you have done it, it's complex. You have to go to to solve differential equations as a sum of yeah infinite sums, and you are right to weird functions. We are not going to go to to that. Uh, but you are right to the wave equations for electrons in hydrogen atoms. And you have those S levels who were symmetric, remember, like in a sphere. And you have P levels that have the shape of, we say, like an eight, number eight, to, yeah, and more complex forms for, for other levels. So finally, with quantum mechanics, yeah, we, we could solve the, the atomic struct, the electronic structure of an atom, the building block of matter. Yeah, and and we we found how how electrons are in those atoms, something we didn't know before. That is, before quantum mechanics, we were expecting that electrons just fall into the nucleus. Yeah, classically, eventually, it, w it was not possible. The structure of the atom was not possible. But we not only solved this type of problems; we solved another type of problem. For example, this one, which we are going to, to need in, in during the week. Something very interesting. Uh, if, if you have a barrier, this is a barrier, yeah? yeah? A potential barrier. And we send electrons with an energy which is below the, the height of the of the barrier. Classically what what we would be expecting. Well, electrons can. Uh, they cannot overcome the barrier and they bounce and go back. Well, that is what classically you would be expecting. 
But from quantum mechanics, if you apply the Schrodinger's equation, you find out that there is a chance for electrons to to pass the barrier. And that phenomenon is called tunneling. Because one imagine that the electrons come to the barrier, we can go over, so it makes a hole and makes a tunnel in, in the barrier and, and, and can make it to the other side of the barrier. Yeah? That tunneling process is is going to be very important in what we're going to, to do in the next days. Okay. See, things get complicated when when we go to three dimensions. Yeah? The um, hydrogen atom was, was a case. Uh, if we go to three dimensions, now we have to replace the second derivative in the Schrodinger's equation for the sum of the three derivatives in x, y, and z. So we, we have that, that thing called the Laplacian. With, well, it doesn't matter the name. Uh, we can solve the, the, the Schrodinger's equation uh, resorting to the separation of variables. So we propose that the wave function, which now is a function of r, r x, y, z, yeah? So we can repl uh, replace that function as a function as the product of three functions, one which is only a function of x, the other is only a function of y, and the other only a function of z. Yeah? That's called the method of variable separation. When we plug in all that in the in Schrodinger's equation, we can we can accommodate things such that we have three functions. See this? This one and this one. Yeah? Whose sum, we sum all of them, it has to be equal to the total energy of the particle. So we have three functions there. If you have done this before, it's, this is simple. If you didn't do, didn't do it, you have to, to do it by hand. It's not very difficult. So you write to the sum of three functions. Three functions. One is only a function of x. Yeah, the first term see on the, on the left. This is only a function of x. This is only a function of y. And this is only a function of z. How can the sum of three functions of different variables you can sum all the three of them and write to a constant. Something that's not it's not working well here. Yeah. Because if this is only a function of x and I change x, I cannot compensate it with these other two functions because none of them are a function of x, but of y and x and z. Well the only way to way out to this is that this in fact this term is not a function of x. And this is not the function of y, and this is not the function of z. The three of them are constants, and the sum of the three constants gives total constant, which is E, the total energy. So we propose then that, that three terms in the, on the left we had before, yeah, they are just constants. Yeah, and and we arrive to equations it's exactly the same for the well. It's like having three wells. One in X, one in Y, and one in Z. So if that is the case, we arrive as in the in the well. Uh, we arrive to three relationships that can that is lambda it cannot be uh, cannot be whatever you want. It's quantized and it's Lambda is quantized, P, the momentum is quantized, and it's what we have written here, the quantification for the momentum in the three directions. The total function, wave function, as we define the total wave function, the product of three wave functions in every direction, yeah, it's the product of the wave function, as we saw before. Yeah? And the total energy is the sum of this E1, E2, and E3, the sum of the three things gives you the total energy yeah, of the of the electron, which can be written as we saw here. We see here, yeah, p squared to two m. But we have the three energies in x, y, and z. So the total energy depends on three quantum numbers, and one and two and three that depends just they can be one, two, and three, yeah, 
the natural the natural numbers and it's going to give me the total energy yeah so the energy is quanti quantized and before but it depends on three numbers on three natural numbers and this is a consequence that of of dealing in uh, of a problem in three dimensions in one dimension we have only one quantum number now we have three quantum numbers yeah in fact when you we study atoms you have a fourth quantum numbers yeah quantum number that was coming from but this was not coming from the Schrodinger's equation but from the Dirac equation is a rel relativistic quantum number I guess you you learned about that well we're not going to deal with that okay so uh, quantum mechanics is telling us what are the possible states of an electron for example within a well within a box yeah as we saw now the next question is how those levels those states are filled with electrons and what is telling about that is the statistical mechanics in in classical mechanics in classical mechanics, uh, as in our atmosphere, for example, yeah, the distribution of classical particles depends on the energy of this, yeah, of, of the state. So uh, this is called the Boltzmann, di Boltzmann distribution. I think you you saw that in courses in classical mechanics. This is called also the atmospheric law. It's the law of the atmospheres, the pressure. In our atmosphere reduces exponentially with the height. You know that? You have you go to a mountain, the pressure is lower. And it follows this this relationship. It's, it's an exponential, a decreasing exponential. So it's very interesting. And at last you can derive this, or you can say that uh, entropy is pushing particles up in our atmosphere. This is an entropic effect. Energetically, the lower energy could be with all the particles in our atmosphere, yeah, dropping and going to the floor. That doesn't happen. Fortunately, we couldn't breathe if that were the case. Yeah, so entropy is playing our favor in this case and pushing particles up. Well, in, in quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics, particles can be bosons or fermions. Hmm? depending on the, what is called the parity requirement of the wave function. Yeah? Uh, I'm not going to go into detail of this. This is somehow an overview of many topics. This could be cover a complete course. Yeah? But uh, particles can behave as bosons and fermions in the sense of if you interchange two, you have, you always solve the, the Schrodinger's equation for one particle, but if you have two particles, what happens? Well, if the particles are indistinguishable, if you interchange the particles, yeah, uh, in principle, the solution sh should be the same, because if the particles are indistinguishable, are the same, yeah, the solution should be the same. But we are dealing with quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is weird. It's a weird theory, in the sense that what sh the only thing that makes sense is the modulus to the square, which is giving us the probability of finding the particle. So if you change two indistinguishable particles, the solution does not need to be, to be the same. It can be the same, but with the minus, yeah? minus sign, because the square is going to be the same result. When you interchange particles, you get the same result in sign. You're dealing with bosons. Yeah? And if the, the sign of the, of the wave function changes, we are dealing with fermions. And this is a property of the particle. Yeah? Electrons behave as fermions. Electrons are fermions. So when you interchange yeah, two electrons in the wave function, the wave function changes its sign. And based on that, <coughs> yeah, if that is the case, fermions have a, a, an strange, a weird property. Yeah? Uh, in the sense that two electrons cannot have the same quantum numbers. If that is the case, the wave function cancels. Yeah, this is a Pauli principle. And the distribution of, of fermions as a function of, of energy 
yeah if you are at zero temperature yeah you you start putting electrons yeah you know that from from atoms and electrons go first to the levels with, with the lower energy but once you have an electron there you're feeling in a state you cannot put another one yeah well in fact you can put two because of the spin which is the fourth quantum number it did not, that's not come from Schrodinger's equation. Yeah, yeah, you can put two if you want. And then you're gonna put a third one. You can go to the next level. Yeah? You can tell me, why not? I go there and the energy is slower. Yes, but the, function, the, the wave function does collapses if you do that. So th that's not going to happen. So as you put yeah, electrons, they start filling up different levels up to a point you end up, okay. These are the total number of electrons I needed to have my my atom. Now the atom is, is neutral. And what that happens for an atom for a system, you're right to 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 yeah, in a solid you're right to energy, which is called the Fermi level. Uh, so up to that point, all the states are filled. This is one, the probability of being filled is one, they are filled, up to that energy. And from that energy on, the states are empty that would happen at zero kelvin yeah temperature zero kelvin as the temperature increases yeah is what happens here yeah is yeah. some electrons can jump to other levels up leaving that level empty and and finally this can be solved it's not very difficult to derive have you done it the Fermi Dirac uh, with the Boltzmann distribution and the Pauli exclusion principle, you can derive this, this equation, the distribution of electrons, yeah? which is a Fermi direct distribution in general for fermions. So now we have Schrodinger's equation tell us about the levels which are possible, and the Fermi direct distribution is telling us where electrons are going to be in those levels. So, in other words, two other equations tell us how many seats we have for electrons. I'm thinking in seats in a, in a theater, thinking on people, and, and then the statistical mechanics is telling us where people are going to be in, in every seat, if the seat is going to be filled or empty. Okay. How are we doing? We're tired. No. Fine. They're very quiet. Students in my country really do not behave as you. They're too respectful. Okay. That's why my country is a mess. Well, we're going to the concept of electron gas. What is an electron gas? It's called, also it's called free electron theory. Yes. Yeah, an electron gas is essentially, we have a box, a potential box, and we put there, in, in, that, in that box, we put electrons, yeah? And this model, the free electron gas, represents very well what electrons do in metals, the valence electrons in metals. Okay, we, and we have all, all we need in the theory, the levels, yeah, the energy levels allowed follow this relationship. Yeah, these are the possible values of the wave vector and pi over L, <coughs> where n is our quantum number, one, two, three, and, and so on. So, if you go to what is called the k space, we imagine kx, ky, and kz. Yeah, the possible values of k. Here is. Yeah, here I call it K1, K2, K3 is the same. Yeah. We can imagine we have a bunch of cubes, small cubes, yeah, and that K space. And in fact, we can say that each state yeah, is specified for three values of K. So it's like every state occupies in, in the K space a volume given for the size of that small cube. Yeah, in fact, it's a point in the space, but you can say that in small cube is connected or related to that, to that point. 
So in k space, uh, every state is occupying a volume of p over l. If we imagine a cube of size l, p over l, p over l, p over l. So an l, l cube is just the volume of the of the cage of the box. So it's like every state is occupying a volume pi to the cube over the volume of the yeah of the box. So the density of states, how many states are going to we are going to have as a function of k, is the inverse of that. We understand that. If every state occupies a volume pi cube over v, we are going to have v over pi cube states per k. Yeah. In that space. You understand that why? I see if you for example. What fruit do you have here? Say, if, uh, if something has, for example, if in a, in a liter you can put, you, know, you have a liter, the volume of a liter, you have something that occupies 0.1 of a, of a liter, yeah? How many of those things can you put into that box? You make the inverse and you have 10 of these things in that volume. Understand it? It is. No, <coughs> you say yes, I, I believe you. So the density of a state is the volume over pi to the cube. Yeah? Uh, then the total number of states in a sphere of radius of a radius k is going to be that density times the volume in k space. And the volume, if the possible values are of n are positive, like here, is going to be one eighth of the of an sphere. And this is what we wrote here. This is the yeah. One eighth of the volume of the sphere times the density it gives going to give me the total number of states. Yeah? And the density of states is going to be the derivative of this respect of energy which is here. And if you refer the density of a state with respect of volume, you have one over volume, the derivative of the respect of the energy. So this is going to give me the density of states and the electron gas theory, which is it's a box. And when, you, when we make the numbers, the density of states take this form. If you make the numbers I showed you before, uh, we're going to need the number two. Yeah, the number two is coming from the spin, which was included here. I mean, if you make the numbers. So the density of a state as a function of energy has this shape. Yeah, the shape we see here, which is a parabola. Yeah. That is the density of a state, the number of seats for electrons to sit. Right. Well, at zero Kelvin, zero Kelvin, well, you start putting atoms there in those levels. I imagine a situation you can put atoms there. It's a way of saying, yeah, right? Up to that energy, and up above that energy, the states are empty. I guess that here the, we can say the metal is, is neutral. If we increase the temperature, if we increase the temperature, some electrons are going to jump to higher values of energy. Yeah? If that is the case, to know what was going to be the distribution, the energetic distribution of electrons is going to be the product of the density of sites times the probability given by the Fermi Dirac distribution. And that product is going to be this, we're going to have this shape. Yeah? Right? There's something interesting here. This is a phenomenon you can understand now. You understand this? This is phenomenal. You put two you put two metals together and you heat it up. Yeah? In the other ends you're going to have a voltage. You know that phenomenon. But it comes out from this from this. Why is that? Does everybody know about this? No. It's very simple. Look at look at this. The the density of the states have this shape. See, it's growing up. Yeah, here it's not flat. It's growing up. If some electrons jump from the left to the right, 
this position, the middle position, this position cannot be exactly the same than before. Why is that? Because here on the right, this area is bigger than this area. You understand that? If if this the Fermi level were the same, and I'm changing from this shape, yeah, to this shape, this area would be smaller than this area because here I have more seats. The density of the state is larger. So the only way up to this is to move the Fermi level just a little to the left to keep the number of electrons present in, in, in the solid. Yeah? And how much the Fermi level moves because of that depends exactly on the form the, the G of E has. And that G of E is a function of the metal. So if we heat up the yeah, both metals together, the Fermi levels are going to change one respect to the other one. And a different Fermi <coughs> level is a different voltage, and you get a voltage. That is a thermocouple. Have you heard of thermocouples? That's, that's the reason how a thermocouple works. And it's, it's not difficult to understand. Well, if you understand quantum mechanics, a bunch of things I've, I've been telling you. Good? Good. Well, uh, Drew and Thompson propose a model to explain the conductivity in a metal. Uh, and they propose, essentially, they arrive, they arrive to what is called the Ohm's law, which establishes a, a direct dependence between the, between the current, the current density, J, and the, the field E and sigma is the conductivity, yeah? Well, in general, in a, in, if we have a, electrons in, in a metal, they are moving in any direction. Here is just a sketch of moving the electron in any direction. So eventually, you expect that after many, many jumps, in average, it's not going to be a difference between the starting point and the finish point. For a specific electron, yes, yeah, the, 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 diff the difference is going to increase because of statistical reasons. But in average, it's not going to change. As you apply the voltage, uh, yeah, field, now the probability to jump in one direction is more than in the other one. So eventually, the electron is going to be jumping, and eventually, in average, it's going to end up at a different position. So a current was established. Electrical current was established. Well, if this guy, Drew and Thompson, apply this considering the electrons form a, a classical gas. So in a classical gas, you have this kind of relationship between the temperature and the energy of the electrons. Yeah? And it was not bad. Their model was not bad. But, uh, well, we can derive many things. Here we have the, the applied field. Uh, and you can derive what the conductivity could be as a function of the, the time between, because the levels are bouncing and knocking one against other ones. So uh, eventually you arrive to a speed, which is a drag speed or a drift speed. We, just call, we call it here v, Vd. After a differential time, the, yeah, the guy is going to move this, this distance. So if we know that the, the conductivity is given by this, this relationship, I'm not going to derive this, but it's, at least you, you know it's not very difficult. At least you expect the, the current density going to be proportional to the number of carriers, the speed, and the charge they are carrying. Sounds intuitively right, yeah? So we can derive this, which is not very difficult. At least this is velocity time mass here on the left, and on the right we have force time time. Yeah? You know that from classical physics. So you, we put that velocity, the, the drag speed or drift speed, we put it here, and we have the, the current. And comparing, yeah, if you look at this, and you remember that J, how was J connected to, to the field? We can derive what the conductivity depends. Yeah. 
what depends on and depends on the density of of carriers which sounds reasonable the more carriers you have the larger the current is going to be the conductivity is going to be the time between uh, knocking one electron knocking the other ones the larger that time the better the conductivity we have more time for the electrons to move due to the field and in inversely related to the mass yeah of course it's more massive it's going to feel it's going to yeah it's going to accelerate in a lower amount and you have the charge twice that's very interesting we have e to the square that is why we have two reasons for that one is the larger the amount of of charge the carrier has the more charge is going to be moving displacing so for that reason it has to be proportional to the charge at the same time, the larger the charge, the force on the on the carrier is going to be larger. So we have two reasons. That's why it appears to the square. Okay. Uh, this model was not bad, but it failed for some reasons. That is, the numerical values were not correct. The temperature dependence was didn't work. The specific heat of the of a gas of classical particles did not match what we found with electrons. Uh, and the reason behind all that was that in, in that classical gas we're using a Boltzmann distribution and we should have been using a Fermi direct distribution. Yeah? Other <coughs> big problem with that uh, that description was the average free path calculations. Amazingly, electrons do not interact much among themselves. And, and the reason is be because electrons are, are fermions and are within what is called a, this uh, fermion sphere. Yeah? This is an equilibrium. So if we have two electrons, say one here and one here, and they interact among themselves, one has to transmit or transfer energy to the other one but they have to end up in an available state. And there are not many available states. Uh, so if one gains energy here, it goes up and can find a state here, but if the other one loses energy, it has to go down, and it's not going to find an available state. So that, that is not possible. It's amazing. The Fermi Dirac, yeah, the, the Pauli principle does not allow me for electrons to interact. So that's why uh, the average free path for electrons is much farther, much, much larger than expected, yeah, from classical physics. So eventually, the electrons that can interact with each other are close. That's only close to the Fermi level, yeah. This is in two dimensions. So the conductivity is not exactly what was predicted by the classical gas, but this what we see here. I just presented this to, this to show you how quantum mechanics change our view of what's going on in a, in a solid. Good. Well, something which is more related to what we are going to see next days. Uh, here is just a sketch that we have the wave functions of two separate atoms. Let's think in hydrogen atoms, something simple. Yeah, this is psi one and psi two for two two atoms. If we put together, yeah, close enough those those atoms, these are those points are representing the the nucleus. Yeah, we have two alternatives. Of the wave functions sum up, yeah, or, or the total wave function is, is the difference between the, the wave functions. This is called by uh, by chemists as linear combination of atomic orbitals. Have you heard of that? Okay. Physicists call it uh, tie binding. They don't get along very well. They also call things which are the same with different names. Since I'm in between, so I have to deal with both of them. Well, if you have, if you're in this situation, yeah, see that the electrons are going to spend some time here, yeah, in between, in between the two, the two nucleus, which are positive. If this is the case, 
Yeah, electrons are going to be to be to stay mostly where they were before. Well, intuitively you see that this situation is energetically favorable to this, because here we have the interaction of the two nucleus. Yeah, so we are going to have uh, the, the total energy of the system if the if the if the atoms are very far away one of each other it's going to be yeah this one let's suppose as they go close enough so the electron of one of the atoms see the other nucleus and vice versa yeah we are going to have two possibilities if the if the wave functions sum up or the total wave function is the difference between the wave functions yeah uh, in this case where the energy reduces is energetically favorable so we expect that this is going as we're going to see. Yeah. Eventually the energy goes up. What's the reason for that? Because as the nucleus are closer and closer, the nucleus are going to see each other. And see that very positive are going to repel each other. Yeah? And also the electrons are going to see each other as it's going to be a problem if you have two electrons. Yeah? yeah. So it's essentially eventually the total energy is going to go up and we're going to have a minimum of energy. This R zero. Yeah. This is the reason why we have binding among atoms. Why atoms would like to be together. I'm describing what is called a covalent, yeah, binding by chemists. Yeah. Why atoms like to be together and separated? Because if they are together, new wave functions appear, yeah, uh, with a lower energy. So that's why they like to be together. So the total energy of the, the atoms separated is higher than we're close. Yeah? And it's called covalent bonding. Well, if, you, if we, we have not only two atoms, but we have a bunch of atoms, yeah? we have, we are going to, they are going to appear a bunch of total energies yeah? for electrons. This is what happens. You solve the problem for four atoms instead of two. Yeah? If you keep adding more and more atoms yeah, and solving the problem, eventually this becomes a continuous of, of energy. It's like at the, at the equilibrium distance between atoms, there appears a band, a band of levels. And this is a band energy, this is called a band energy. Yeah? This happens for an infinite number of, of atoms put together. The number of states within a band, yeah, no, it's not infinite, but it depends on the number that is related to the number is, is the number of atoms you have, yeah. Good. Let's see the case of of metals. Yeah, uh, depending on this, we have we have just seen we are going to have a metal, an insulator, or a semiconductor. Yeah, that's amazing. Quantum mechanics predicts, predicts the existence of different types of, of solids. And what is the difference from that point of view? There are many different, there are many different uh, ideas or criteria to, uh, to determine what type of solid we are dealing with. Uh, the one we are talking here is the one uh, is relevant to our, our purposes. Uh, in metals, yeah, the Fermi level drops in a position where you have states available. Yeah? And this is the case of sodium, this is schematic. See, so you have the 3s level, the, the, the level 1s, 2s, and 2p are very deep. So they practically don't see each other, and, and the structure is essentially the same for the, for the, in the solid of, of sodium, like an, an isolated sodium atom. But the, the energetic electrons, yeah, they form bands. And here you have the 3s band and the 3p band, right? Well, the Fermi level drops here, so, yeah, in, in the middle of the, the band generated by the 3s levels. Yeah? And since the Fermi level is at the 
in a position which is within a region with a lot of levels available, if I apply a field, the electrons can change the energy and move more in one direction and in the other one. And this is going to conduct electricity. That's the reason that we have a metal and we have a, a solid that con uh, permits the conductivity. Yeah? Of conductance. Yeah? The conductance is, is finite. It's, it's a good conductor. And this is what we define as a metal. Yeah, this is a metal. Uh, I want to stress something here. I've read in many books and many many people saying that to have conductivity you need what is called <clears throat> the overlapping of the of the bands. Have you heard of a band overlapping? Here we have a band overlapping. You see the three P band is overlapping with the three S band. And you have an overlapping there. But this is irrelevant. The Fermi level drops here. I don't care what happens. I'm much farther away from that place. Yeah? We don't need overlapping to have a metal. Or relevant overlapping. If the three P levels we don't, exi we don't exist, the, the solving would behave the same. Yeah, I say that because in many books it's, it's written, it's written, it's not correct. To have a metal, you have <clears throat> the Fermi level, you need the Fermi level to drop to be in a position where you have states available, period. If you have overlapping or not, or not it's irrelevant. Yeah? Maybe to have okay, states where the Fermi level drops, you need overlapping. Well, okay, it could be, definitely. Yeah, but it's not the it's not the basic reason. Okay. Well, we're going to go fast with the crony penny model. This was the first model which was successful to explain bands. Yeah, and it's from 1928. It's called the crony penny model. Crony and penny were Mr. Crony and Mr. Penny were the authors of the paper. Yeah, for you to know. So the chronic penny model is a very simple model. It's, in fact, it's the most it's the simplest model you can build to see what happens. Yeah, when you have an infinite amount, infinite number of infinite number of wells or barriers, as you want to, as you prefer to describe this, you have a potential which is not a well, it's not a barrier, but a continuous number of wells and barriers, uh, and this has translation symmetry yeah it's, it's always the same if you're in this well you cannot distinguish between this well and this well and so on and it's infinite both directions uh, people typically in books solve this problem which is just a little complex not so terrible but it's easier than the the hydrogen atom in three dimensions uh, and then since the solutions became very complicated. They jumped to this this model. Uh, to me, I think it's easier. Why don't we solve this problem from from the start? And that's it. Since eventually we're going to came out with a solution to this problem. And what is this problem? It is essentially the same we have uh, we have here the original chronic penny model. But instead of having barriers, yeah, in this way we have barriers which are delta Dirac functions. I don't know if you are used to this. These delta Dirac functions are are, uh, are very special functions because it's infinitely high but infinitely narrow. Yeah, but it has a specific surface. Uh, it's an abstraction, but it's very useful. So, if we solve, we are going to solve this problem essentially with books. Yeah. Uh, to solve this problem. I'm going to go fast by this. I don't care much about the mathematics, but the final solution. Uh, we have to propose that the solutions are the solutions named after Felix Bloch. Bloch was a physicist. Yeah, and his solutions were of this kind. He said that the psi of x, the, the wave function, is a product of two functions, u of x times e to the i k x where u of x is a, a function with a its periodic function with a period of the, of the potential. Uh, and the reason for that is that essentially, since all the wells are the same, 
since all the wells are the same, eventually the probability distribution in every well, what the electron does, it has to be the same because the electron cannot distinguish one well from the other one. So essentially the wave function to the square has to be the same, modulus to the square has to be the same for every well. If that is the case, when I make the, the absolute value of this and a squared, is the same for every well. This is going to change exponentially, but I don't care because the modulus of this exponential is one, so I don't care. Yeah? So, this is a general wave function, and, and this, this, if this is solution, we can propose that the solution in other wells is the same except for the exponential, and we can find which is a derivative, which is not difficult. And we have to plug in all this in the Schrodinger's equation and find out the solutions. Yeah? I don't know if you have done that, when it, this is becoming more complex. As you solve the problem of the well, but then now it's a bunch of wells, many wells. Now the differential equation is this one. You see that essentially, if we solve the problem in one well, we are going to have solve the problem to every well. Yeah. So you solve it for the first well, which is between zero and L. The general solution to this equation is just a sum up of exponentials, imaginary exponentials. Yeah. And then you have to use the Bloch theorem, which is what we saw before. Yeah. If we know the solution in one well, we are going to know the solutions in other wells. And we apply the derivative also, which we know what is the difference between the derivative on one side and the other one, and the properties of the delta functions. And if, essentially, because of these two connections, because the wave function is, is continuous, and the discontinuity in the derivative of the wave function is, is related to the delta Dirac of the of the potential, we have two equations, yeah, for yeah for the constants which are playing here, A and B, and essentially we arrive to a system of two equations equal to zero, so the determinant of the system has to be zero. If not, we don't have solution. You are aware of all this? I'm going too fast now. It doesn't matter. Now eventually we arrive to a condition for the solutions to exist. If the if we know we don't satisfy this relationship, we have no solution. This is essentially the same in the well. We have one well. For the solution to exist, we we, we need to have an, a specific energy which is related to a specific value of the wave vector. Here is the same. For to have a solution which exists, we have to satisfy this relationship. And uh, we have alpha here, which is related to the energy, and we have k here. Yeah. We have alpha, alpha, see, and k. So, in fact, this is a dispersion relationship. It's connecting alpha with k. Energy, alpha is energy, energy with k. Yep. So, <coughs> here we have again what we have to satisfy for solutions to exist. We have, this is a sine of alpha L of alpha L. So if you remember, this is a function of the type sine of X over X. It has this shape we see here, <coughs> the shape of the blue line, plus a cosine. So if you sum up the cosine, this goes a little higher and this is the final uh, blue line. And for this to, to be to work, the sum of all these two terms have to be equal to this term, which is a cosine of KL. And in principle, you say, well, this can be the same all the time. Well, that's not the case, because the first function, which is called the crony penny function, can be higher than 1 and smaller than, than minus 1. And if that is the case, we cannot satisfy that, because the cosine only goes from minus one to plus one, right? So that's why I wrote this, yeah? I draw this one and minus one. So 
when the cosine of chi of I mean, the, the, the chronic penny function goes between minus one and one, we can have a solution, and in, in this place we have no solution here. We have solution. We have no solution. We have a solution here, yeah, and so on. But what appears in this model? This, this is the simplest. I, I understand it's not so simple for the if you see it for the first time, but this is the simplest possible model you can build of a, of a crystal. That is, the crystal understanding by a crystal, uh, uh, a bunch of wells order, yeah, from minus infinity to infinity, one dimension. We have some translation sim translational symmetry. So, from that model, it appears that there are bands of energy which are allowed, and forbidden gaps, yeah, another band, forbidden gap, another band, and so on. So naturally, from the Schrodinger's equation, it appears that we have allowed bands of energy and forbidden gaps of energy. Yeah. So if we yeah, we see here that this is alpha l, alpha is related to to the to the energy, and and and, and then we have k. Yeah. So essentially, this is. What we can draw is to extract from that relationship the energy as a function of k. And you're going to find relationship, yeah? Which is a dispersion relation between the energy and k. We can put all this together in, in the chest between minus pi l and pi l. Why is that possible? It's possible because cosine of chi l is a periodic function. So you can unplug everything to between 0 and pi over l. And between minus pi and pi of our possible values for the cosine. So this is the reduced scheme of the dispersion relationship. And here we have the first possible band, a forbidden ga a gap, another band, another band, and so on. So this is supposed to be a simple model. It's not so simple if you see it for the first time. But in this model, which represents the crystal, because you have translational symmetry, bands of energy appear separated by gaps. Yeah? Well, something interesting. Uh, you know that the force yeah, in classical mechanics is the derivative, derivative of the momentum with respect of time. This, this is force equal mass time acceleration, yeah? Because P is mass time velocity, and then if the mass is constant, you take the mass out of the derivative, and you have the derivative of a velocity with respect of time, and that is acceleration, right? This is the second law of Newton, Newton's second law. And, and P in quantum mechanics is h bar k. It's h bar k. h is a constant, h bar takes out of the derivative. So force, See, in quantum mechanics, it is proportional to the derivative of k respect of time. Yeah, that's interesting. And we also know, yeah, that force has to be the mass times the derivative of velocity respect of time. We put to the mass an asterisk because we are not going to find we're going to find that that is not constant. And also the velocity, you know, because at least I mentioned that today. That the group velocity is derivative of omega respect of k, but omega is e over h bar. So we can say that the speed, the group speed, the group velocity, is one over h bar derivative of e over k. Well, now we have to put everything together. Yeah. So we have this derivative we multiply by the uh, differential k numerator and denominator. And we can write out things like this. And eventually, if you look at this, you say, oh, OK. <coughs> For this to be equal to the first definition, the mass has to have this shape, this form. Yeah? And the form of the mass, which is called effective mass in quantum mechanics, depends on the relation between, relationship between the energy and, the, and, and k. And depends on the second derivative. So within a band, within a band, an electron presents an effective mass that depends on the dispersion relationship between E and, and K. 
And amazingly, that, that mass can be positive or negative. And this is fantastic. We can have a part particle with a negative mass. Yeah? Uh, so you have to remember this. Uh, the mass is inversely related to the second derivative of the, of the energy. Do I have it here? No. Okay. You can have it here. See here, for example. And the minimum of this. Here the second derivative is positive, right? This is a minimum. So here the mass of the electron, the electron behaves having a, a, a positive mass. But at the top of a band, like here, here the second derivative is negative. Here the effective mass is negative, right? So that's that's a very interesting result. Yeah, it's amazing. That's a negative mass. I push in this direction, the gas accelerates in the other direction. Amazing. Yeah. You can say how that kind is possible. Come on, can can cannot be possible. I'm pushing the gas in one direction, the gas accelerates in the other direction. Well, the reason behind that, behind that is that the electron is not isolated, the electron is in a crystal. When you're making a force, the electron is also receiving the forces of the whole crystal. Yeah, that's a more complicated problem. Okay. So, I think I'm ready. You too. Stop that guy talking, please. Well, if you have a band, then, yeah, like this case, yeah, and the Fermi Dirac function, yeah, is of this type, and the Fermi level is in the middle of the gap, in a place, in the, sorry, in the middle of the of the band where states are available, we have available, we are in the presence of a metal, like this. This would be the distribution, the energetic distribution. So the, here it's not to be completely flat, but once some electrons are going to be above the Fermi level and there are going to be lack of electrons below the Fermi level. But if you apply a field, if you apply a field, electrons from here can go up or whatever, adopt different energies, and the total current is not going to be zero. Yeah? And why? Do we have an insulator? When an insulator is the case in, in which the Fermi level drops in the middle of the band gap, where there are not available states. If that is a situation, and this is very wide, yeah, it's very wide compared to this, the lower band, which is called the valence band, is going to be completely filled with electrons. And the upper band is going to be empty. Yeah? Why we don't have conduction here? Well, the conduction band is very easy because there are no carriers. So since we have no carriers in the conduction band, there's not going to be any contribution from the conduction band, right? <coughs> and the balance band, the balance band is full of electrons. Why don't we have a contribution of electrons there? Because have you seen, have you have seen, in, in, the, in the dispersion relation, relationship, have you seen this? Yeah, dispersion relationship, you see, you have positive case here and negative case here. These are positive speeds and negative speeds. <coughs> you have as many electrons going to the right and going to the left. And if the band is completely filled, we are going to have always the same amount of electrons going to the right and electrons going to the left. So a filled band does not conduct electricity. There is not a net conductance. Yeah? Right? So and here we have the balance band completely filled of electrons. So we are going to have always the same number of electrons going to the right and going to the left. I'm not saying to the right or left because it's a one-dimensional model. That's why I'm referring to that. So we are not going to have the conductivity. And this explains something that people couldn't explain before, quantum mechanics. Why? How can it be that we have a solid with a lot of electrons. We apply a field and there is no electric conductivity. 
yeah that was the case of insulators and here we have also another solid that apply a, 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 in a small voltage and we have a lot of electrons moving how the how can that be possible this conducting and not and the explanation is here yeah in fact there are a bunch of electrons moving to the right and to the left they are moving they are always the same number moving to the left and moving to the right so there is no net conductivity well and what is a semiconductor <coughs> what is what is a semiconductor well essentially a semiconductor is the same as an insulator yeah qualitatively is the same yeah the only difference is the width of the of the gap that's the only difference but that difference makes that at regular temperatures yeah the fermi dirac distribution is such that we are going to have electrons in the conduction band some electrons not a large amount but a reasonable amount and there are going to be some empty states at the valence band and that is going to make that we are going to have some conductivity not much but it's, it's going to conduct much less than the metal but we are going to, to see or detect some conductivity that's a semiconductor so the difference is written here the forbidden gap is not very large and therefore there is a considerable number of carriers not many but there are carriers so there is some conductivity that's the reason it's called a semiconductor so essentially a semiconductor is the same than insulator with not a very large band gap so since we don't have a, a, a terrible difference and, and so the difference is quantitative and not, not qualitative uh, so the definition is it's not very straight it's not very rigid i would say and and the fact that when do we, when do we have an insulator and when when we have a, a semiconductor well it's a matter of definition yeah what are your standards there is a clear definition between a metal and an insulator or a semiconductor but there's not a clear definition between a semiconductor and an insulator in fact when i was your age your average age is clearly lower than mine many of the nowadays semiconductors were considered insulators so the club of semiconductors gaining members it's gaining members yeah i don't know why but we have less and less number of insulators nowadays to have an insulator you have to have a very large gap really nowadays it's a more exclusive club yeah i would say okay I think that was enough for today, and you will have been very patient. Yeah, I have make a, the whole material I have given today very fast. I really should cover a whole course of a semester. Yeah, I think I, I have to give an overview because we have five days and we have to reach other subjects. I guess you knew most of the subjects, most of the topics I talked today. But in a way, we are going to have, I wanted to have the same or similar background. So you got to start from sensors, I'm, I guess you're not <coughs> going to understand much. I hope you are, you are going to understand much more than before, after the, this first class. If you come tomorrow, because maybe because after today, you don't come tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> What do you usually do? You are open to questions, something like that, Raman? Sorry, um, how are you done? Yeah, I'm done. You, you, you tell me 10.45. Right? Uh, first, uh, yeah, <laughs> you have it
okay, you understood everything or nothing? Good, good. Let's break the ice, we say. Yeah, okay, right. So you talked about the overlap. You said hmm? the overlap is not needed. To have a metal. To have a metal. So I think you had the example of sodium. Yeah. But if you have a, you know, an alkaline earth metal, like something like uh, calcium or magnesium. Oh, good. Then you will need it. You will need <laughs> it. In principle, we will need it. Okay. Uh, say, say, say the following. Every band has as many <coughs> levels as, as primitive cells you have, the number of cells you have. So if the, if the solid is made of atoms which are monovalent, every atom is going to contribute with an, one valence electron, right? So since any band is going to have 2n, and if n is the number of atoms, it's going to have uh, n atoms the band is going to have two n states because of, because of the spin. If you have a monovalent atom, you're going to, you have to uh, accommodate n, uh, n, n electrons in that band of two n. So the Fermi level is going to drop in the middle of the gap, in the middle of the, of the valence band, of the band, right? No, you didn't follow me. Okay, <laughs> again, you have a solid made of n atoms. Every atom is going to contribute, if it's monovalent, to the valence band with one electron. But every band is going to have two n levels because of the spin. So that band is going to be filled 50%. Since that band is going to be filled in half, yeah, this is going to be a metal. It's metallic. So all the, uh, all the solids made of atoms from the first column of the periodic table, which are monovalent, are going to be metallic. You understand? They're going to be metallic, no, no way out. If you have, you go to the next column in the, in the periodic table, now the atoms are divalent, that is, every atom contributes with two electrons. If you contribute with two electrons, is going to fill the valence band because the valence bands have two n electrons, two n states, and you have two n electrons. So that band is going to be filled. If that band is completely filled, that band cannot contribute con to conduction. So in principle, that column of, of atoms in the periodic table should be insulators, but they conduct electricity. How can it be? Because you have overlapping. Bands overlap, and since the bands overlap, yeah, the total, is, you have a continuous of states related to two bands and not only one. So the Fermi level, but essentially the Fermi level in that case, as in any metal, is going to be, it's going to drop in, a, in an energy position where, where you have a, a, a states available, available states. So that's why it behaves as a metal. So if for a divalent, uh, divalent atoms, if they conduct electricity, you need to have overlapping. An important thing I didn't say that came to my mind. In, in the crony penny model I show you, there is no overlapping. In one dimension, it, overlapping does not happen, does not take place. Overlapping is a two or three dimensional uh, phenomenon. Because electrons can that is, the pants depends in the what direction the electron moves, because depending on the electron, you have a different, yeah, a, a, a different structure for the potential. So by changing the direction, the electron, uh, we have a different structure, of, uh, band structure. And that's why you have overlapping, band overlapping. Band overlapping is, is not a phenomenon that takes place in one dimension. Yeah, the chronic panel does not predict overlapping. Yeah, we saw it. What were you talking? You see bands and gaps in between. That's it. Yeah. We have uh, atoms with balance three, like aluminum. You are going all to have one band completely filled and the next band filled by 50%. So that again has to be metallic.
right? That was your question. I passed, <coughs> I passed professor. <laughs> yes, please. Please tell me, tell me. Why? why? Oh, why? Well, in, in, in any in any structure we saw, we have band, we have a band gaps between allowed uh, between con yeah different bands, yeah. What defines a semiconductor or, or an insulator is the Fermi level drops in a gap, not in a in a gap of allowed states, yeah. That's what makes, uh, that's the definition of an insulator or a semiconductor. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll just start the tutorial session. And as I said, please make sure you write your name and your institute, just so that we can prepare all of your uh, participation certificates. So uh, in this tutorial, we will sort of go through a few problems. The goal is not to, you know, make you solve them here. I'll guide you through the steps, but the point is to see how we can use these problems to understand uh, some of the concepts uh, Professor Celso talked about uh, in the first part of today's class. So we'll start with something really simple. Uh, we have a gold wire. It's around one centimeter long, one millimeter square area. So think of it as a regular wire. I want to know how much or how many electrons are flowing through this wire when I apply a potential of 1 millivolt, right? So let's sort of draw this. So maybe I will go to here. So let's think of our gold wire, 1 centimeter long. I apply a potential of 1 millivolt across it. So this is my potential, so I have 1 millivolt across it and I want to know what is the current. Once I know the current, I can basically back calculate how many electrons are flowing. So this material is gold and the electrical resistivity of gold is given to you, it's 24 uh, nano ohms meter. So nano is just 10 power minus 9, so it's just 24 ohm meter. So I need to connect resistivity to resistance because I can use Ohm's law, V equal to IR. I know voltage, that's 1 millivolt. I need to find current for which I need R. So we link resistance R to resistivity, just rho L over A, this is standard formula, rho is 24 times 10 power minus 9, length is 1 centimeter, just to be consistent, we convert 1 centimeter to meter, so the units are the same, so 10 power minus 2 meters. And the area is 1 millimeter square. Again, we convert millimeters to meters. So 1 millimeter is 10 power minus 3 meters. So millimeter square is 10 power minus 6. Once you do this, uh, resistance works out to be 2.4 times 10 power minus 4 ohms, right? So gold, <coughs> it's a very good conductor. So your value of the resistance R is very small. So I know V, I know R because I just calculated R. So I can get the current is just V over R. V is 1 millivolts. So just do the math. I've already done it for you. So uh, I'll just write down the answer current is around 4.2 amperes. 
let me just take a new page. So what we calculated from the previous page is that the current through the wire is 4.2 amperes. So we make a big assumption when we are doing this. Usually whenever current passes through a wire, there will always be heating, uh, we call it joule heating. And whenever there is heating, there is temperature rise. Temperature increases means resistance increases. We are sort of ignoring all of that. Turns out this current of 4.2 amps is actually pretty high. Uh, you have a very thin gold wire. It's not going to take so many amps of current, but we are just doing the math. So we get an idea of some of the numbers that we are dealing with. Current is nothing but charge per second. So I have 4.2 coulombs of charge that is flowing per second. Each electron has a charge, so the charge of an electron is 1.6 10 power minus 19 coulombs. I know the total charge that's flowing per second, so then the number of electrons is just 4.2 by 10. and then if you do the numbers uh, you get something like 2.6 times 10 power 19 electrons per second so we have a very simple gold wire I am applying just 1 millivolt across it and through this wire I have a current or I have around 10 power 19 electrons that are flowing through it. Is this a large or a small number? What do you guys think? Is this too many electrons, too less electrons? Do we say too many or too little? It looks too many, right? So if you say 10 power 19, 10 power 19 is 19 zero so that seems a lot but let's try to put this number in perspective so let's calculate how many gold atoms are there right so we want to know how many gold atoms are actually in the wire and then we will put this number in context so uh, we can calculate the number of gold atoms per unit volume. So N which is gold atoms per unit volume. Is nothing but the density of gold. So that's 19.3 divided by the atomic weight is 197 times our Gadro's number. So this is around 5.9 times 10 power 22 per centimeter cube. So this is the number of gold atoms per centimeter cube. So the volume of the wire, remember length is 1 centimeter, area is 1 millimeter square, that's about 10 power minus 2 centimeter cube, just converting everything into the same units. So number of gold atoms in the wire is around 5.9 times 10 power 20. And we calculated number of electrons flowing per second. <coughs> is around uh, 2.6 times 10 power 19. So now we have some idea of the numbers. You have 2.6 times 10 power 19, but if you actually see, there is something like 6 times 10 power 20 gold atoms. Each gold contributes one electron. So this is approximately the number of <coughs> electrons in the wire. 
So even though this number seems large, just in the context of how many gold atoms are there, we actually are utilizing only percentage is approximately 4%. So we have only 4% uh, of the atoms being utilized per second for your current to flow through the wire. And this is again a consequence of something called uh, the free electron gas model, uh, which Professor Selso talked about. Uh, and then we will come to that again in the next question. So, any clarifications, any doubts? Okay, so let's just move on to the next question. Uh, I'm, I'm not doing something that's really complicated. As I said, it's more to sort of reinforce the concepts that you have been learning, uh, just doing some math. Okay, so this goes back to the uh, free electron gas model again. What is the probability uh, that an electron occupies an energy level 0 0.03 electron volts above and below the Fermi level at 300 Kelvin? This I'm not going to do 500. Once we do 300, uh, 500 should be easy. This is essentially the equation that we would be using. This is, of course, uh, the Fermi-Dirac uh, equation. So let's go back uh, to the drawing board here. So this is the equation f of e. So this is your Fermi-Dirac equation. The question says E minus EF is equal to 0 0.03 electron volts, right? So this is approximately 30 milli electron volts. Again, to put this energy in context, KT is approximately 25 milli electron volts at room temperature. So when temperature is equal to 300 Kelvin, uh, KT is 25 milli electron volts. So this energy is very close to the Fermi level, right? It is not very far away. So if we can calculate F of E, so 1 over 1 plus exponential, this is 30 this is 25 because E minus EF is 38 milli electron volts. KT is 25 milli electron volts. So if you do the numbers, uh, this works out to something like, uh, let me just write it down, 0 0.26 or 26%. So there's a 26, 25% probability that an electron is available at 30 milli electron volts uh, above the Fermi level. What about below? If an electron is below, then instead of plus 30, we just say minus 30, right? Now E minus EF is minus 30. And then if you do the math, this comes out to 0 0.74. 74%, right? So it's very symmetric. So if I have this diagram, and this is what we drew earlier as well, f of E versus E. So f of e is your Fermi function. It can take values between 0 and 1. It's a probability. It cannot go uh, beyond 1. And when e is equal to the Fermi energy, uh, f of e is half, right? So uh, that's the middle point. So if you go slightly above in terms of energy, Essentially, your probability is very uh, small. So maybe I will take a different color so we can show this. 
So if I were to draw f of e above ef as opposed to below ef, so this is at 0 Kelvin. So what I have drawn here oh, sorry, is essentially at 0 Kelvin. And at some other energies, we would essentially draw something like this. Uh, so the two graphs are essentially at increasing temperatures, which means as you increase temperature, electrons that are closer to the Fermi level start to go up. And the more the temperature, more is the probability for the electron to jump. So that's what this really tells us. What it also tells us that when it comes to electrical conductivity, if I have a metal, let's say gold, as you saw in the first example, it's only those electrons that are very close to the Fermi level, which are actually involved in electrical conduction. So all the other electrons you can sort of ignore and you only focus on the electrons that are close to the Fermi level. And this is actually a very good assumption uh, because later when we talk about uh, semiconductors, Professor Celso started it today and we will continue tomorrow. We will use whatever <coughs> equations that we derived for metals to describe semiconductors. And the reason we are actually able to do that is again because we are only worried about those small uh, number of electrons that are close to the Fermi level. So that's what uh, this uh, equation shows. And that's what this question shows as well. Any questions from you guys? How will I do this at 500 Kelvin? If I have to do this same calculation at 500, what would change? The KBT would change, right? Because your equation would just be the same. If you want to write it down. So everything else would remain, this temperature term will change and if I want to calculate at a different energy level, let us say I want to do this at point 0.1, then obviously E minus EF would change. So essentially this equation can be used uh, to calculate what is the probability of finding the electron within a band at any given temperature T. Okay. Go to the next one. So this again goes back to uh, the density of states. So uh, we talked about calcium. Uh, calcium is an alkaline earth metal. So it's in the second uh, column of the periodic table. And we want to find out what is the Fermi energy of calcium just by using the free electron gas model. Right, so we are going to assume the temperature is 0 Kelvin because that helps us in making the calculations. But what we really want to do is find out uh, EF. So if, if you were to look at the equations, uh, let me use a pen for now. So N is the total number of electrons that are there in the energy band. So maybe just I'll make an annotation. N is the number of electrons that are in the band. It's nothing but G of E, which is the density of states, times F of E, which is the Fermi function. So density of states tells you how many states are there for electrons to occupy. F of E tells you whether that electron is occupying that state or not. So this product actually tells you the number of occupied states. So G of E times F of E is number of occupied states. Which is equal to 0 to EF G of E D. Right? So we are now doing this at 0 Kelvin. So this equation simplifies to this equation 
at 0 Kelvin. And that's why we assume the temperature is 0 Kelvin. So it is a lot more easier for us to solve the equation. So let me just erase this so you can see. So now when you do the integration, you get this relation between n, which is the number of electrons, and the Fermi level, which is what we want to calculate. Number of electrons is related to the number of atoms. Rho here is the density. So density is number of or the mass per unit uh, volume, atomic weight. Na is Avogadro's number. And Z here is the number of electrons per atom, right? It is the valency. So calcium, what's the valency for calcium? Two, right? Each calcium atom can give two electrons. That's why we say S2. Uh, so all of these numbers are known. Uh, they are actually given here in the uh, image to the right. So from all of these, you can calculate N. So uh, if you do the math, N for calcium is 2. Density is 1.55. Atomic weight of calcium is 40. Our Gadro's number is 6.023 times 10 power 23. So uh, if you do that, that comes out to be like 4.7 centimeter cube. Just to be consistent with units, we convert everything to meter cube. So that is N. So once I plug this n in, all of these are constants uh, and the only variable is EF and you get EF is 4.7 EV. People have also done measurements for calcium. You can measure the Fermi level. I think measurements around 4.6568. So the Fermi level is very close to what you would expect from the free electron gas model. So again, this is just a simple calculation to show you that just by using this very uh, basic model, uh, we can actually get some numbers that match well uh, with what people see in the literature. Questions? You can also do the reverse. If you are given the Fermi energy, from Fermi energy you can calculate N as well, right? The number of electrons that are there inside the band. It's Then you would put the value of EF here and then calculate the value of N. Sir, so, yeah. how do you calculate experimentally? How do you calculate the Fermi energy experimentally, Salso? Uh, is it, uh, you can calculate the, uh, using, for example, um, how how thermionic uh, current goes. That will be a solution for that the way out. So basically, we go back to something called the thermionic emission. You will not exactly get. You will get more the work function, right, rather than the Fermi energy. But you back calculate from the work function. So thermionic emission is very simple. So let's say I, this is my FEG model. <coughs> this is vacuum. This is Fermi energy. All of these are electrons. I shine light. Depending on the energy of light that I shine, I can actually get electrons to emit out of my metal. And the kinetic energy of the electrons is equal to the energy of the light minus a term phi, which is called the work function. So phi is the work function. So potentially you can scan, you can change the incident energy. From the incident energy change, you can get the kinetic energy and then you can map the entire band. And once you map the entire band, 
from that width you can calculate what the Fermi energy is. Something like that, that's what we would do. And we'll use the, yeah, you've seen the, this is UPS, the right? Yeah. yeah. UPS, UPS. yeah. So this is a technique that is called UPS, uh, ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy. So that's that's a simple way for you uh, to calculate the Fermi level and also the work function uh, in the case of a metal. Most of you would have heard about XPS, right? What's XPS? So X-ray photoelectrons, the same concept, except that there you would use X-rays and they would have much higher uh, energies. So you're looking at the core levels. UPS, because you're dealing with the valence electrons, uh, you actually don't uh, need that much energy. You essentially use UV rays. All right, uh, questions? Yeah. So in semiconductor, uh, how we will do the same, same experiment will be carried out on the semiconductor? Because electrons will be in conduction or valence band. Mm -hmm. So how we will find? How would you want to find uh, what? Work function or work function. So for semiconductors, things become slightly more complicated, right? So now you have two bands. Uh, so, Celso, can we use this for semiconductors directly? Uh, it is exactly the same. The photomission is exactly the same. But uh, how would you predict where the Fermi energy is, right? Oh, okay. The, the Fermi level is going to drop in a, yeah, it's not there. But if, if you get more, you're going to have a, during photomission, you have a, essentially what what is still and a different yeah. energy. So, and, and then you have a, a reference will be the Fermi level, which is what everything is connected. So it's going to be the Fermi level of anything which is connected with this metallic. So you know experimentally what a Fermi level is. Okay. And when you have a start, you start having both electrons, you have the, the, the top of the band, which is filled with the balance band, and then going down, you're going to have a total description using photomission. You get it? Because essentially, when you when you run the experiment, everything is grounded, so the Fermi level is common to everybody, right? So, what you're essentially saying is, when you do the experiment, you would your semiconductor would be deposited, right? You would have some sort of metallic contact. Eventually, you have to yeah. Metallic contact. So you would not only really get uh, the data from the semiconductor, but from the metal. And once you know the metal's Fermi level, you would map that onto the semiconductor. Another way you could probably do STS, scanning tunneling spectroscopy will tell you, not the Fermi level, but uh, the filled and the empty bands. Yeah, I think so. so there is another technique called uh, scanning tunneling spectroscopy. Uh, we haven't really talked about it in the course. It's a lot more involved. Uh, you did a lot of STS, STM, right? No, not much. Not in John's group? Uh, yes, but not, not much. No so that's another technique for you to map the bands. Finding Fermi level is, is always tough for a semiconductor because defects would play a role. Mm -hmm. uh, so then you don't know, you know, if there are defect states, are they failing the Fermi level? So we always talk about UPS in the context of metals. Uh, I'm not so sure how well we can use it for semiconductors. At least uh, that's that's my take on it. I think it's fine. You have said it's, it's fine. Sure. Okay. Uh, questions? Sir, how does temperature affect the Fermi energy level? How does temperature affect? So you want to take it? Okay. <laughs> yeah. In a metal, it's not going to change much. Okay, I'll show you. Yeah. Much more than that. With the temperature. Uh, I, I should run yeah, I, I'm it's really to do with work. 
say that as the temperature increases, the third level has to adjust because the thermal direct function, for example, the function that it is dealing with an air traffic, it has to get back to the preserve it with the energy. But I think as the temperature changes, the Fermi level, the Fermi function changes a lot, the Fermi direct function changes a lot. So the Fermi level has to adjust to have neutrality. To have neutrality. <coughs> and that, for that reason, the Fermi level goes to adjust and is going to do much more than the next one. And the fundamental will change its step because of the distribution that G of E actually show you. So it's not going to change much. So you think that that will, it will depend on what so I think tomorrow you will talk more about intrinsic and extrinsic. Yeah. So there you will see what Professor Celso is talking about that depending upon whether the dopants are ionized, your Fermi levels will shift. So maybe after tomorrow would, would be a better time to uh, visit your revisit your question. Anything else? All right, so uh, let's move on. Probably the last question for today. So uh, again, I wanted to pick something up which uh, Professor Celso talked about, uh, which is essentially the 1D model. Uh, but we have what is called essentially uh, an empty band model. And I'll tell you what it means in a minute. So we want to draw the energy band diagram. Uh, under the empty lattice approximation, which is same as the empty band model. And uh, there's something called the extended and the reduced zone scheme. So this is similar to the, the chronic penny uh, the Professor Celso talked about, but now we don't have to worry about potential. So there are no gaps. Uh, and, and then we can draw something continuous. So let's see if I can do this. So this is our standard equation, we will change to black. So your energy E uh, depends on the square of K. K is, K is nothing but the electron wave vector. So whether K is positive or negative, energy is always going to be positive, right? Because it just goes as K square. So if I were to draw this, E versus K, then we get this very nice parabola, uh, which is centered at zero, Let's draw it slightly better. So we get this parabolic behavior for E versus K. Turns out k is actually a vector, it's not a scalar. And now we have a 1D lattice. So I have lattice points which are separated by some space A. This is real space, uh, usually for drawing energy bands. We map this onto something called the reciprocal space. This is also just now going to be a series of points, but now the distance is 2 pi over a. So this is just a reciprocal lattice, one dimensional reciprocal lattice. So you go from lattice points with space a to reciprocal lattice points. Uh, which are spaced uh, 2 pi over a. So let me just draw the reciprocal lattice again. So let me, I can pick some particular point as the origin. Let's say I pick this particular point here. And then I can just draw my uh, lattice. Oh, maybe it's a better way to draw this. I'm now just drawing this in what is an expanded zone scheme. So this is my origin. 
I would refer all my k lattice points to this. Uh, so I would just draw everything with respect to capital K. So this is K and now K is a vector. It can be positive or negative, it doesn't really matter because the energy will just be the square of the modulus. So energy would just be a positive quantity. This is called the extended zone scheme. This is just 2 pi over it. But people don't usually draw in this extended zone scheme. They define something called a reduced zone. Where k, they write now, it's small k. I'm not writing capital K, I'm writing small k. Which has values between pi over a and minus pi over a. So they define what is essentially a zone uh, this is called the Brillouin zone so they define this reduced zone and then capital K is written as the small k plus a translation vector g where g is nothing but 2 pi over a, uh, let's say some number h, and h can be 0, uh, plus minus 1, plus minus 2, and so on. So you can take this extended zone and then reduce it or fold it back into uh, a smaller region. So if I were to draw this again, this is my center point. <coughs> energy so this was your extended zone now I define a smaller region which is pi over a and minus pi over a this particular thing will not change uh, this is just going to be the same any point that lies outside this reduced zone we bring it back So the red curve and the black are essentially the same. All we have done is take the black curve, which is the extended curve, and, and then fold it back within this region. So this is your reduced zone scheme. While the black uh, is the extended zone scheme. This is called the empty lattice approximation because the lattice is said to be empty. There are no atoms, there are no potentials. The moment I start putting atomic potentials, then these energy levels, this should actually be continuous, you see. So these energy levels, which are all continuous, will start to develop energy bands. So you will see gaps start to open up. So one way, of course, these gaps form is through the Kronig-Penny model. You assume there is a periodic potential and you do the math. Or you just say, I have an empty lattice where everything is continuous. And then the moment I add atoms, uh, I will also have energy gaps opening up. It's a more qualitative model. It's less mathematical than the Kronig-Penny. But both proceed upon the same assumption that I have a lattice. And wherever I have reciprocal lattice points or wherever I have atoms, I have scattering and that scattering opens up uh, energy bands which essentially in three dimension leads to the formation of band gaps. So that's what uh, this particular problem describes. Any questions? Okay. So, you mean Kronig penny model is for semiconductors? No, uh, Kronig penny model is, is first of all, it's a one dimensional model. So, really, there is no equivalent system, right? Any system that we have is always three dimensional. 
So Croning penny is a one-dimensional model that shows how band gaps are formed because I have atomic potentials. That's correct. Yeah. So in in three D, uh, you will have let's say if I have a three-dimensional crystal. So uh, you will normally have three let's say three principal directions, right? You can think of three of them as three one-dimensional crystals. So all of them will have gaps. If these gaps all overlap, then the whole material will have a band gap and, and then it is said to be a semiconductor. But if those gaps don't overlap, if there is a way an electron can go continuously in energy just by changing direction, then it becomes a metal. So Kroning penny is just 1D. Once you expand it to 3D and, and you look at the full band picture, then you can classify whether a material is a metal uh, or a semiconductor or an insulator. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Even through that 1D model, we are defining band gaps and uh, in AK diagrams. So, yeah, in the Croning Penny model, yes. Even there in the 1D model, uh, we are defining gaps. Then the question is uh, how do you fill those energy bands, right? Uh, so, if, if you have one electron per atom, then the band is only half full. So even though you have gaps, you will still say that is a metal. If you have two electrons per atom, then the band is completely full. Uh, then you have a gap and so on. That's, that makes sense? Yeah, so we, we never talked about, okay, there are gaps, but how many electrons are there? That's something we, we didn't discuss. Okay. All right, uh, if there are no other questions, then I guess that's enough solid state physics for today. So uh, maybe we will we'll stop here. We are anyway close to uh, the end of time. I think tomorrow we will start looking more uh, in depth into semiconductors because today, think of today as essentially a foundation uh, through which we can understand semiconductors. <coughs> and once we have the foundation, uh, we will also be able to look at uh, a variety of other properties and other applications uh, of semiconductors. Alright, so uh, we will see you guys here tomorrow again uh, at 9.